Um, welcome everyone to this exciting session. I will be the moderator for this panel. Um, I'll begin with just a brief introduction. Um, we have with us uh, Joel Harrington, Joseph Harrington, Marianne Williams, and um, Daniel Lina. Thank you very much. We will be talking about um, antitrust um, and detectives today. And I'll just start with introducing um, our panelists for the day. Joe Harrington is um, the Patrick T. Parker Professor at the Watton School of Pennsylvania. Um, and he's a leading authority in collusion and cartels. Thank you very much for joining us, um, Joseph. We also have with us Marianne Williams, who is the Michael J. Crouch Chair for Innovation at the University of New South Wales. Thank you very much, Marianne, for joining us. And we have Daniel Lena who um, is jointly appointed at the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and the Maconic School of Engineering as a Director of Law and Technology Initiatives. And his teaching focuses on innovation and technology, including antitrust, um, artificial intelligence, et cetera. So thank you all so much for joining us. We'll begin with Joseph Harrington, who's going to give us a presentation on his paper. And after that, we will go into um, the questions for the panelists. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I presume everyone can see that. So, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking uh, about a paper with uh, David Imhoff, who's at the Swiss Competition Commission, and this is all about using data to find cartels. Now, right from the start, I want to be very clear that the deliverable is not to deliver the evidence that could be used to actually convict firms of a competition law violation. Rather, it's to provide the evidence to be the basis for initiating an investigation, and perhaps a dawn raid, for which actually has been uh, some cases in which cartel screening did actually lead to the uh, Dodd raid. Now, the method of cartel screening I'm going to describe today is what's known as behavioral screening. And this is looking for patterns in firm conduct and outcomes that is indicative of collusion. Now, there's two fundamental reasons why I think behavioral screening can work. And in fact, it has worked. The first is that collusion has to mean a change in the price generating process or if it's an auction, a change in the bid generating process. And this is because if, it, if that isn't the case, the inclusion isn't going to be profitable for the firms. The whole point is to get to different prices, and that means a potentially detectable change in the price generating process. The second reason why I think behavioral screening can work is that collusion is difficult. It poses a lot of challenges for the cartelists, they have to coordinate on outcomes. They have to monitor for compliance. They have to punish in response to evidence of non-compliance. And how they deal with those challenges leaves an evidentiary trail, which in principle can be picked up in the data. So if one is going to engage in behavioral screening, there are two things you need. First, you need data. And secondly, you need to know what to look for in the data. Now, for this to be practical, the data should be fairly easily available. And what I'm going to describe today, in all cases, it was either price or bid data, which in many cases is something that would be available, at least for some markets, for a competition authority. In terms of what to look for in the data, there are three approaches. The first one is clusive markers. That is, patterns that are more consistent with collusion than competition, as indicated by theory and past empirical evidence. The second is structural breaks. That, that is a change in the data generating process, you know, due to, for example, cartel birth, which, which I just mentioned, but it could also be due to cartel death or just some interruptions in collusion during the time of the cartel. And the third is anomalies. And these are just patterns inconsistent with competition that may ulti ultimately be found to be consistent with collusion. Now in the paper, we cover all three of those approaches but due to time, I will just cover inclusive uh, markers and structural breaks today. So inclusive markers, I mean, these are just regularities that help us distinguish collusion from competition. It could be high prices relative to a benchmark. 
It could be a V-shaped pattern to prices where prices fall prior to cartel formation and are the reason for a cartel forming and then rise after the cartel is formed. It could be low price variability, a periodicity of price changes, stable market shares, a whole host of, of potential markers. And just to kind of illustrate this approach, I'll focus on the low price variability. So if you think about a firm changing prices under competition, this is gonna to tend to occur when there's any sort of you know, significant change in cost or demand. But the process by which prices change for a cartel is very different. To begin, it's gonna to have to be in response to common cost and demand shocks because all firms are gonna to have to change their prices. Secondly, it can only be done after communicating and coordinating. And furthermore, it must be done in a way that does not jeopardize cartel stability. And these factors all have the implication that cartels tend to uh, have more stable prices. They tend to uh, change price less frequently and the price changes tend to be smaller. To illustrate this, let's look at the urethane cartel. So what we have here, over time, are prices and costs for the urethane manufacturers who are involved in the cartel. The red line is the actual price. The green line is a measure of cost. And the blue line, we can ignore. We have prices and costs during the cartel period, and then after the cartel period to capture competition. So let's begin by looking at competition here. We see the red line, somewhat masked by the blue line, but we can follow it there. And the point we just wanna make here is that the red line tends to, its movements tend to track movements and costs pretty well. If we look over during the cartel phase, we see a fairly significant change in costs over that time period, but the prices set by the cartel are relatively flat. And so this is an example how a cartel often, not universally, but often results in more stable prices. And so that leads to this low price variability. So now we can use that to develop a, a Calusa marker, which is a low coefficient of variation of price. So the coefficient of variation of a random variable is just the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. And if we look at the, at, at the implications of collusion, well, as just argued, Collusion is going to tend to result in more stable prices, which means a lower standard deviation, and there's a lower numerator in that ratio. Of course, collusion results in higher prices, which means a higher mean of price, which is a higher denominator in that ratio. And so both those forces result in reducing the coefficient of variation. For example, in the frozen perch cartel, the coefficient of variation for price under collusion was more than three times smaller than it was under competition. Okay, so let's go to the second approach, which is a structural break. So once again, this is just a change in the data generating process, whether you look at prices, bids, market shares, quantities, whatever it is one has data on. Uh, as mentioned, uh, you're gonna get a change or a break in that process with cartel birth. Prices are going to rise. They're going to probably be a transition phase. And once it gets through that, prices will tend to be more stable. But the point is, there'll be a change in the price generating process between competition and collusion. Now, kind of savvy cartelists can try to manipulate this process to, to, in order to avoid the chances of detection, especially if they think a competition authority is engaging in this. But, it, but a very important point is that while they can reduce the power of the screen, they cannot eliminate it entirely. The only way to do that would be to basically not change the price generating process, but then collusion would not be profitable. Now, another source of uh, structural break is upon cartel death. And that's, we expect to see prices fall, become more volatile. Now, this break is a particularly promising one for identifying a cartel because a cartel cannot manipulate this price process in order to make it kind of less detectable. And that's because the cartel no longer exists. It has collapsed. And then finally, there can be detection due to temporary disruptions of collusion, either due to internal instability, uh, because a firm cheated, there was a there was temporary price war, or external instability because of entry or expansion of a non-cartel supplier. Once again, let me give you an example. 
Uh, this was a generic drugs cartel. The firms were bidding on procurement contracts uh, that were being issued by a public health provider in Mexico. And what we have plotted here are data for the winning bids. And we have two of the 20 drugs that were used in the study or used in the, it was in the study, but also used by the competition authority. And we see a vertical line here. And that vertical line is where the cartel collapsed, just due for other reasons. So what we see is that prices were fairly stable prior to cartel uh, collapse, and then they dropped significantly and became more volatile. Same thing is true over here for calcium. Now, you don't need any kind of statistical analysis to conclude that there's something worth investigating here. Just need to plot the data, and it's clear there's, there's been a fundamental change in the you know, winning bid generating process, and the most likely hypothesis is that there had been a cartel in place, which now no longer exists. So what I turn to next is kind of the second part of the title of the paper, which is machine learning. So what I've described here is, you know, putting forth a, a, what seems to be a plausible screen based upon theory, empirical evidence, involving simple data, simple analytics, calculating means, variances, plotting the data. But to make this more effective, what we can do is draw upon supervised learning to come up with better screens or really the best screen. So I'll describe this in the context of procurement auctions because that's where the work has been done. So what you start with is you start with data from procurement auctions for which some of the tenders we know had a cartel, had a bidding ring, and we know that other tenders uh, were subject to competition. So we have data on collusive tenders and competitive tenders. And then we want to identify some summary statistics of that data, which we'll put into the machine learning algorithm. And these are effectively are ones that potentially could be collusive markers. And what the machine learning algorithm is going to do is going to find the best model using those summary statistics in order to classify a tender as either being produced, the bids associated with it being produced by a cartel or being produced by competition. The study that I'm going to just briefly review was the first analysis of this sort in the literature, which is which is conducted by my co-author David Imhoff and his collaborator Martin Huber. And so what they had on what they had was uh, data from Swiss procurement auctions and road construction. Uh, they had four markets in which there were a, a cartel in each of those markets, but they also had data encompassing kind of the non-cartel phase and approximately about 300 inclusive tenders and about 300 competitive tenders. In terms of the summary statistics, this just gives you a flavor of what they put in there. They had the coefficient of variation for bidders bids within a tender, a little bit different from what we described earlier. And as we can see here, just looking at the raw data, that the coefficient of variation of bids was less for the collusive tenders and the competitive tenders. That is, when they're colluding, the bids weren't as dispersed as when they were competing. Another summary statistic they put in was the difference between the second lowest bid and the lowest bid that tended to be higher for collusive tenders. And similarly, they put in just some other kind of measures that potentially could prove informative. So what they did, this is a kind of a standard machine learning exercise. They took, in this case, three quarters of the data to estimate the model's parameters. They then used the other quarter of the data to test the model's performance and searched over kind of different models to find the one that had the best predictive value. Uh, they, in terms of classifying the output as, you know, that the tender was collusive or competitive, they use the criterion that the estimated probability of collusion exceeds a half, but one can do this with other you know, criteria. You could make it more stringent by saying the estimated probability of collusion has to exceed three quarters, and they experiment with that as well. And the, But the only point I want to kind of convey here is the, the overall kind of exercise and that the performance just on this initial attempt was really quite good, that the 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 uh, screen that was developed through this machine learning algorithm 
properly classified inclusive tenders 83% of the time and properly classified competitive tenders 85% of the time. Now, while these false negatives and false positives may be of a level that we, you know, one would be a little bit concerned, once again, if you're putting this forth as evidence in a judicial case, the point is that we're just trying to identify those markets for which the evidence is highly suggestive that there may be a cartel and thus may warrant investigation. And I think these, uh, this model is kind of delivering that type of, of information that would be very relevant to that. So just in uh, kind of concluding, let me just talk about, you know, just uh, some extensions and work in progress along this line of research. Uh, Joseph, sorry, just to cut in. Um, yes. we, we need you to conclude in about a minute or so. Excuse, excuse me? We, we need you to conclude in just about a minute or so. Oh, okay. This is the yeah. last slide. So, so, uh, so uh, what I've described is the development of a screen through machine learning to identify tender as collusive or competitive. Uh, there's also been work to try to identify when there is a collusive tender, which firms are party to the cartel. There's a challenge of transposition. So here you would be training the algorithm on data for some class of markets or some country. And then you wanna see how well does that perform in a different set of markets in a different country. So they've done this where they've trained data on, or trained the algorithm on Swiss data, then applied it to Japanese data, trained it on Japanese data, applied to Swiss data. So you can gauge in that exercise. And the last one, which is just really starting is uh, to use deep learning where what the input is, is not really data, it's actual plots. And so the, here now the, the objective of the learning algorithm is to try to pick up visual patterns that, were, that are consistent with with occlusive tenders, such as a, a clustering of bids. So with that, I will conclude and I you know, welcome the, you know, the comments and thoughts of the other panelists. Thank you very much, um, Joseph. Really interesting um, work here. Um, I, I'll open the floor to the other panelists just to give maybe their ideas um, on the paper. Uh, Marianne, perhaps you can begin with you. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, great to be here and uh, I really enjoyed reading this paper. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very insightful. I love the very concrete examples. And it's sort of really inspirational for future work because, because it, you know, it is very concrete and it, it just zeroes in on the actual problem, okay? And I think that just allows you to then, you know, potentially see different ways of looking at it and but also just how complex you know it's a it's a wicked problem in a way and um, this particular paper sort of tries to simplify it down to, to, to so that it's understandable right because if we can really have a good understanding of the underlying problem and tease out the sort of assumptions like what's really going on here with the firms colluding and how does that relate to the data we can collect. Um, so so I, I really loved it. Um, and it, you know, just as in the presentation, you know, there's a very insightful kind of um, well, a deep understanding of collusion, right, by the authors. They know what they're talking about and they've, uh, they, they, they sort of take you on this journey uh, that helps you understand the kind of the, the motivation, you know, why firms um, collude, why they think they can get away with it, you know, and they're after higher profits and competitive advantage. Um, and, you know, you sort of get a very strong and, and real world impression of um you know the data that you might be able to collect that you that that humans at least uh can scrutinize you know with with tools of course um and the sort of heuristics that people can use to try and you know catch uh cartel behavior or collusion and the role of these behavioral methods, right? And that, you know, these methods are used, I think, after the fact, right? So once the collusion has either been born or been happening or died. In fact, um, I, I love the kind of uh, analogy 
sort of an analogy with a star, right? Stars are born, stars exist, and then they they die and they collapse. Mm. And yeah, so I, I sort of had, uh, you know, a lot of astronomical um, analogies running around in my head. Um, the examples, as I said, are, are very useful, particularly of the, um, the data patterns, right? And what I really noted is the need for them to, to be visible, right? Because they need to be human understandable, human interpretable, human detectable, all right? So that again made me excited because I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here and, you know, all of the work in the paper on the machine learning, I think is, 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 is very kind of useful. And again, it, it, it's just laying the foundation and the platform for a lot of really interesting uh, future work, which I guess we'll, we'll, we'll get to a little bit later. Um, and I think the, the section that really highlighted the need um, for you know new ways of doing is the, the lack of data, but also the difficulty of translating data from one context uh, to another. So it's a huge challenge to kind of generalize these collusion patterns across markets, even though we can very carefully articulate, you know, the patterns we're looking for, you know, the stability, the lack of variation, the lack of response to, you know, changes in the market demand or pricing. Um, and, you know, I, 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 what also came across to me is just how sort of crude they are, right? Um, and kind of relying on human detection with, you know, these sort of heuristics. And um, I guess I felt like there's a lot of opportunity to kind of totally rethink um, and, and almost disrupt uh, the way that, you know, you, you might go about it. And um, so uh, some of the things I wondered about was, um, you know, how, uh, you know, to what extent are these sort of machine learning methods used in practice? Is it just limited to, you know, the examples in the paper? So I, I, that, you know, maybe the answers in the paper, maybe I, 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 I just didn't pick it up. And how different uh, is collusion behavior in different markets? How does it look when you might have, you know, a dominant player like Amazon? And I, I, I guess I would have liked to have seen a bit more finesse around the kinds of differences that, that can appear. Now, I know the paper is trying to actually crystallize the common patterns and the sort of heuristics that uh, collusion detectives might use to uncover where there might be uh, collusion. But uh, there were just some of the things that... Um, I was thinking about and uh, I'll stop there and uh, I have some other ideas around, you know, uh, how, you know, what might be the next steps or what's another way of looking at this problem, you know, through the machine learning lens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, and really great insights there um, on how you've analyzed the paper, the challenges, but also the opportunities that, you know, you've identified with this kind of, um, you know, technology. Um, we, we, I have noted some of the questions you had, but we, I will give the floor to um, Professor Lina to just give his thoughts and then we can, you know, have a, an interesting Q&A where we can also address some of the questions you've raised in your analysis. Um, Professor Lina, happy to hear your thoughts um, on the paper. Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Marianne. And thank you, Joseph, for a great paper. Uh, I, I put together some slides just that I'm going to run through with the, the points I, I wanted to make. Um, so I, I really appreciated the, the detail, uh, particularly in the first part of the paper about how market data can be used to detect cartels. And I think it sets it up really well to think about machine learning. And I think your paper sets itself apart in that way. I think too many papers in this whole realm kind of just jump into the machine learning and the fancy methods and, and uh, you know, assert a level of accuracy without kind of thinking about some of the foundational questions and kind of what's the state of the art right now. So I think that's really important. Um, so, uh, um, and, and I think you do, do a nice job in the machine learning uh, approaches part too. It's very, very accessible. Um, what I wanna talk about is kind of like that, the discussion about the problem and solution today, 
Uh, the lack of theory data and detection, because I think that that can be maybe some obstacles to success with machine learning methods, and, and so the need to do more there. Evaluation, you touched on this a little bit more in your presentation today, but I noted that I think there were some areas where I just saw discussion of accuracy that I'd like to see a more robust discussion of, of uh, false positives, false negatives, maybe framing it with precision recall and F measures. And I think, you know, just a couple other things, and I realize this is designed to be a short paper, so these are just kind of additional things that could be discussed that I thought about looking at your paper, but thinking about assessing the impacts and harms as we as we do more with machine learning in this space, and then thinking about threats uh, to these models through adversarial learning. Uh, so what's the problem? Cartels continue continue to form. Uh, you, you pointed this out uh, as going through this, right? We're not trying to make a judgment on whether there is a cartel. We're just trying to identify scenarios for doing more analysis, collecting non-economic uh, economic evidence. So humans are in the loop. Uh, but when we think about the, the impact analysis, I think it's important to think about false positives, false negatives, the extent to which how we design these systems, how they're used, whether humans are more likely to accept what systems are, are, are saying or maybe to, to reject it. So those are important questions um, around that. It's, it's really interesting, this question, that we don't really know the state of the art right now. Uh, detection is low, I gather, from, from other research, but we really don't know. So this makes it a really challenging problem. It's a very open problem. Uh, we don't, as far as training our algorithms, we, we, there's a lot of missing, a lot of missing information. Um, but then you also talk about the lack of theory and data, particularly when you're talking about structural screening. And so I think that there are clearly then opportunities there to think about, well, how do we make sure we have sound theory in place when we are designing machine learning methods? Uh, and then how do we go about getting more data, more data so that we can, we can make these these predictions. Um, I think it's interesting to, to think that, uh, you know, some of these, some of the barriers, right, to, as how well then that without understanding the theory and having the data, uh, how well current methods can work, and then what are the obstacles that this presents for using machine learning in this place. Um, but then also thinking about the impacts and the harms of, of how these, uh, how these systems will work. Um, you in your presentation brought this out. Why do we think that this might work? And I, I agree completely, right? So if they're going to collude, uh, we think there are going to be changes in the, in the data that is generated. And then this idea that there's going to be an evidentiary trail as, um, as collusion is, is carried out. So there are good reasons to believe machine learning can be helpful in this space. Why? Well, okay, why do we want to use machine learning? Because right now, which is being done manually doesn't scale very well. If we had machine learning methods, we could scale that and possibly reduce the cost of screening, right? I think that, yeah, that's yet to be determined. Uh, this idea that we that tools should be reliable, easy to explain, um, that's important, right, in thinking, in thinking through this. And this article does a nice job of, of providing um, a nice, easy to explain process of, of how these things work. You you touched on this a little bit in your presentation. I don't think this was in the paper, um, but so the evaluation, right? I think we need more than just accuracy and we need people who are using these tools to understand more than just accuracy. You did get to that part a little bit later, like the, how do we um, make sure regulators can use these tools and understand how they might tune them for them to be uh, to adjust for which they think is less uh, you know, harmful, false positives or false negatives. Um, but then also questions about validity. And we don't really necessarily know what the ground truth is here um, as we're putting this together, particularly with such a low detection rate and so much missing data. Uh, so I think there's there's a there are some gaps there to, to cover. Uh, so on both of these, right, I think in the paper was, there was just accuracy information. Um, I think the, inf the one of the things I'd love to dig into a little bit more is that you talked a little bit about a lot of different people using these, be using these tools, not just regulatory agencies. And, um, but then this brings in the mind, what about strategic behavior? And you make a couple of assertions around this that I might push back a little bit, that which I think theoretically makes sense, but what about an application? So we think, oh, well, it even works if, if the cartelists are, are, are uh, strategic and trying to avoid uh, detection, um, even if they're managing the way that they increase prices, 
okay, well, how do we really know that? And uh, sure, theoretically, yes, but in practice, um, you know, for all we know, pe these cartels are already, the more sophisticated ones are already using some tools to be able to evade detection already. Uh, so this, you know, I think we need to think a little bit more about that. Um, and I think one of the things that comes up in this space frequently when we start thinking about algorithms, uh, again, what is the what are the impacts and harms uh, to, to, uh, to consumers, but then to also industries, but then what about exploiting the law? What about gaming? Um, maybe maybe these organizations are just gonna use these tools to determine the boundaries of the law. I'm a little less worried about that. I think we need to figure out then to better define law so we can prohibit the behavior that we wanna prohibit. Uh, but what about adversarial attacks? And uh, you know, I think a lot, many of us have seen these examples introduce a little bit of a noise of noise into an image, for example, and instead of a stop sign being read as a stop sign, it's now read as a yield sign or a speed limit, or here's another image recognition example. You give this to an Im a particular image recognition system, it says 65% uh, probability it's a Robin, introduce a little bit of noise, uh, and, and that system will tell you it's absolutely certain that now what all of us as humans see as a Robin is a waffle iron, right? And so in what ways might um, car cartels actually not just engage in strategic behavior, but um, actually use adversarial attacks against these systems so they can evade detection? I think that's something to think about. This fits in the, the thinking about our, our ethical issues, about transparency, accountability, and fairness. Uh, I think what's important on the theory side that we think about what is the purpose of antitrust? It can affect millions of people. Underrepresented groups may face disproportionate costs of the decisions, whether to enforce or, 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 you know, or not take action. How do we test the accuracy of these systems? How do we understand the impacts uh, of false positives and false negatives on consumers in different industries as we use these tools? Uh, how do we test for biases? Uh, what additional features do we need in the data that we're gathering to test for bias? Uh, I think those are those are important questions. Uh, and then one of the last things that that I'm, the last thing I'm going to mention is is you talked about models across different countries. I think that's really exciting, right? Is is thinking about particularly given the shortage of data, right? How do we understand how we can use data across jurisdiction to to improve these systems? So I look forward to discussing uh, some of those things. And again, a uh, great paper. I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Elena, for, um, you know, that breakdown on your thoughts on the paper. Um, Joseph, we'll just come back to you just before we dive into the questions. I could give you a minute or two if you have any comments on, um, you know, Marianne and um, Professor Elena's uh, presentation. Okay, let me see if I can come on, on a few th things that you have. That's a lot. I mean, there was a lot of yes. really substantive comments there I yeah. could spend a long time on. So let me see if I can just identify a few. Uh, let's just start with Daniel. I, I think one of the key things before getting into machine learning, and, and, and you know, it was a uh, point was made about how you kind of start out before getting machine learning, you got kind of going over the economics of it. and that's because that was the state of the science until machine learning came along for a long time. Uh, so one of the key things is for a screen to be costly to beat. You know, some there, there are some screens which are actually are costless to beat. There's not many, but there are some. But a lot of screens, you can think about like price relative to a benchmark or price variability. Yes, they can do things to make the screen less effective, but it's cost them profit. And that's that's the essence of it. So so that's why I make that statement that at the end of the day, the test will still have power because firms are not going to strategize to the point of having the screen have zero power because then they make zero money on collusion. OK, so that, but that's by the design of the screen. Um, yeah, the. Uh, you know, the, the issue of false positive, false negatives and the actual true cost of that is indeed really important. My initial take is probably the false uh, positives. It's probably the bigger cost because if it leads to investigations where there is actually not a cartel and competition authorities have scarce resources, uh, so that would be a concern, you know, I, I think uh, as, as a primary cost. Um, you know, uh, let's say to Mary Ann, um, you know, in terms of uh, yeah, the question about how common is behavior across cartels. Yeah, I would say, you know, the first half of the paper seeks, you know, it only kind of touches upon it, but 
tries to identify those clues of markers, which are fairly common. There's nothing universal here, but that's really coming from various studies and theories, and, and those things are not kind of specific to any particular, particular market. So I think there are kind of markers out there uh, that can be used. And in terms of just how widely is machine learning used in practice, I really don't know on that. Uh, competition authorities are very private about this, and they're the ones that have the have the best data. But I tell you what, let me let me kind of just stop there because I know that there's many other questions. Great, thank you very much, um, um, Joseph. I think now we'll open the the, the session into questions. Um, and I'm seeing the audience also has quite a number of exciting questions, but I'll just start um, with you, Joseph. Um, so you've been researching on cartels for several years now, and given the very low um, detect detection rate, how confident are you that antitrust agencies will adopt the tool you've presented or similar ones? Okay, so I do want to say this because I have a paper that specifically makes this point. We really don't know how many cartels we uh, go go undiscovered. There's many economists who are going to get this thing wrong. Uh, and that goes back to a point that was, you know, Daniel raised, which is there's a lot we don't know because these are crimes and we can't do random checking of industries to find out is there a cartel or not. Um, so I, I think competition authorities have become increasingly receptive to this. You know, I think back to 2005 when I first spoke on cartel screening at a conference in Rome. There was, you know, one or two, I know the Dutch Competition Authority was doing some screening, but it was really off the radar. And then, you know, 2016, I was at a conference with an ICN conference with chief and senior economists, and more than half of the 27 competition authorities were engaging in some form of screening. Now, that can be pretty wide. But uh, so there's been kind of growing kind of use of it. But I think particularly in the last few years, there's been a lot of interest for the very simple reason that leniency programs are, well, let's say leniency applications are drying up. Let me not say they're, in a, they're becoming less effective, but leniency applications was a really important source of cases for competition authorities. But if you go to the US, European Commission, many other jurisdictions, they're finding very few leniency applications. They're way down. So they are looking for alternative methods to find cases. So I think the interest is there and there's been a growing kind of use of screening. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Williams, coming from outside antitrust, which detection tools do you, um, you know, envision for antitrust agencies? Yeah, well, I think this paper really just opens the door, okay, to uh, yeah. a really exciting new world. Um, and it calls for radically new approaches, though, because I think what the paper really highlights is is the struggle, you know, with current methods and the lack of data. That that seems to be the real bottleneck here. Uh, and it's it's not just the volume of data; it's the relevance of the data, and you know, because we would expect machine learning, in particular, to be giving us a lot, you know sort of the ability to really customize to specific markets to specific not just countries um and uh so i think there's a huge opportunity here for human ai collaboration so we're learning in other uh domains that ai just can't do it all by itself not even in radiology you know because the five years ago we were told oh we don't need to train radiologists anymore because AI can find, you know, cancer in those images so much better than any expert human. Well, nobody knows if any radiologist has ever lost their job, but uh, no, there's no evidence for it. And, you know, even with AlphaFold, which is the latest big thing from DeepMind, uh, where they can predict the structure of every single known protein, which is really quite extraordinary, yet that AI can't predict interactions, mutations, um, and it's not gonna do that anytime soon. So people, I, I think what we're what AI is really doing is highlighting the importance of people. And that's where these visualizations become super important. And yes, it's just detection. It's not the actual, you know, um, charges or enforcement or anything it's just picking it up and yes we do need to pay attention to resources right 
And, and in a way, the resources could be part of the model um, if we had enough data. So uh, one way to get data or several ways to get data would be synthetic data. So there's a whole kind of new industry in creating and synthesizing data according to sort of certain spe uh, specifications. That used to be a ridiculously hard problem because, you know, if you use sort of an equation or, you know, some math to generate data, then all you found in your machine learning was that equation. But anyway, methods are a lot more sophisticated now, and I feel like that would be a very promising area. Also game theory and agent simulations. That's another way to generate um, not just data, but also to explore the different kinds of behavior and different kinds of scenarios. And, you know, if it's AI driven and using some of these adversarial methods, uh, then you're going to uncover behaviors that you didn't even think of, right? And I think that uh, probably these cartels have thought of them, right? That's their, that's their, you know, expertise. And so I think that, you know, we could use game theory to uncover those, well, existing behaviors, potentially creative behaviors, but also discover equilibriums that may give us insights around the rate, you know, what's the kind of uh, expected rate of uh, collusion in a specific market. And that would help us uh, in determining, you know, how much we want to actually spend on catching people. And when we've caught enough people or when we've, you know, somehow, uh, you know, because we want to reduce those um, false negatives, right? Uh, that, that, that's really the, the thing you want to optimize. Anyway, that, that's enough for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor uh, Williams. Very interesting insights here on synthetic data, game theory. Um, I'll just go to Professor Lina and just want to hear your thoughts on the same question. Which detection tools would you envision um, you know, for antitrust agencies? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that to me, so many of these areas, I'd like us to focus on the problem more and really thinking about the problem. And, and you know, to this point that Marianne was just talking about, kind of like transforming the way we're doing things. And I think, you know, in my my own area where I, I look a lot at how computation is changing, legal services delivery, courts, and just, you know, the thinking tends to be like, well, how do we automate what we've always done, right? And I think we need new ways of thinking about the problems. Um, and so approaching them in a very disciplined, rigorous fashion, spending more time thinking about the theory, uh, thinking about what kind of data we, we need, um, thinking about opportunities for fine tuning these tools for specific markets and, and where we think there can be transfer learning, uh, thinking carefully about these questions about false positives and false negatives and what the impacts are, what the, the harms are um, when, when we're using these tools. Uh, so I, to me, I think that, you know, again, as I, as I said in my presentation, I think that there's a problem with a lot of the work uh, in, in machine learning where I think people start with the tool, right? And like, what cool thing can I do with this? And what sort of, you know, well, what sort of results can I generate to get a paper published? And we need a lot more people who, now, I think Joseph's paper does a great job of demystifying these concepts. And that's wonderful because we need more people who can pick up a paper, understand what's going on and learn about these tools, understand from a functional perspective, what is machine learning doing uh, and help us with thinking about uh, you know, how these tools can uh, you know, be used in different ways to, to solve the problem. Right, um, but then also identify some of the issues like we were talking about, some of the bias concerns, adversarial learning. Um, what are the you know, what are the impacts and costs of false negatives and false positives? How might these develop? Right, who's going to get left behind? Who's are are, are underrepresented groups going to uh, disproportionately bear the costs of the ways that these tools may fail to perform the way we want them to? Right? All important questions to ask as we're as we're using these tools in this space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Elena. Pro Professor Williams, I'll just go back to you. If you could just shed some light on how the courts are reacting to computational tools in your field of, of research. Yeah, well, I think the, the courts are curious, uh, but it doesn't really, I mean, 
there's very little use of machine learning in, you know, outcomes or recommendations, you know, in, in court. Uh, I mean, you know, we've, we've got the sentencing um, example that we all know. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, that, that this is a new technology, right? Uh, we don't even understand it. So, you know, it's going to take a while before the courts start to embrace it. I did give a talk uh, two weeks ago to the New South Wales Bar Association. So there's a good sign, okay? The barristers and, and, and sort of uh, lawyers are, want to know how they can use it in court and what it might mean for them and, and, and their whole industry. But, uh, you know, while ever we have the questions, uh, you know, that have been raised by Daniel around, you know, the, the bias and, and just basic safety and security, and, you know, the lack of transparency and explanation, people need to know why. The courts need to sort of, they need motivation, they need to understand why, so they can find those causal links. And without that, uh, I think machine learning is... Um, not really going to deliver, which is why, you know, I was talking about, you know, these AI human collaborations where, you know, uh, we can, you know, use machine learning in this kind of interactive way to help us understand what's really going on here. Yes, we can visualize, we, you know, we need a lot of tools to kind of dig into the recommendations and the sort of outcomes and, uh, and decisions of, of machine learning and it's got it's it's not sort of a, a one-shot thing it's we're not going that we're not going to get those explanations from the model itself uh it's going to come from you know a separate process around helping people discover and understand uh what the model's finding in the data in a way you know these models are just sort of a tool for us to explore data that you know we can't live long enough uh, to actually explore by ourselves so it's just accelerating our access to a very large amount of data it's really doing nothing more than that and uh, allowing us to kind of, you know, pursue or ask new questions or gather evidence uh, for patterns uh, that may or may not be there. Uh, Professor Elena, have you have you seen uh, you know any similarities, differences from Professor Williams' answer in terms of how courts are reacting to computational tools in your field of research? Yeah, well, so in my field of research, I, I guess I look at what is the law of these technologies and think about how the law needs to evolve given these technologies. I'm actually going to drop an article in the chat. We did a, a conference on law and computation the year before last and, and uh, sitting district court judge, Judge Paul Grimm and a couple of researchers, Maura Grossman and Gordon Cormack wrote a great article about thinking about the use of artificial intelligence, introducing it as evidence in courts, how do the evidentiary rules apply. Um, and, you know, judges like, like Judge Grimm are doing some really great work saying that, hey, judges need to learn about these technologies so that they can be better informed. So, uh, of course, this is going to be a battle of experts if you want to truly put on AI evidence in a, in a court proceeding. And judges need to understand, uh, you know, how to play their role in this in this process as far as gatekeepers and, and uh, ensuring that that process plays out well when AI is introduced. Um, a lot of my work is focused around thinking about how to create tools for automating, providing legal guidance and um, using those tools in, in, the, in providing legal advice. And there's still a, quite a bit of hostility by the organized bar, uh, lawyers as a guild, um, I won't call them a cartel, as a guild, I'll, I'll say, uh, definitely are, are, are resisting in many ways the use of, of these tools. Uh, but I think that's another reason why we need people to better understand how these tools work, because uh, as Professor Williams was saying, I, I think what we see in law as well is there are huge opportunities uh, for these tools to augment what we do as lawyers. Uh, but then, you know, there's a huge underserved uh, market. There, there are millions of people, when you look globally, billions of people who don't understand what their rights are, uh, even if they do understand their rights, don't have, don't have the guidance they need to enforce those rights, well short of them going to court, things like that. And absolutely, we could be creating computational tools to help those individuals. And uh, so, 
We've got a lot of, of work to do to see that courts are changing, judges are, are changing their attitudes, practicing lawyers, uh, law schools are doing more to embrace the use of these tools, partnering with technologists, things like that. So I have, I'm optimistic, um, but things are still moving quite slowly, I would say. Great. I think now we'll just open the floor to questions that we have from our audience. Um, we have very interesting questions coming in the Q&A session. And the first question is from Georgetta, which relates again to the courts. And um, uh, uh, Georgetta asks, we see that the courts, um, at least in the jurisdiction where Georgetta is working in Romania, they struggle with the concept of accepting economic-based evidence in antitrust. And so what can be done to increase the court's preparedness or openness to discuss um, this concept or you know, to discuss AI-based evidence? Um, and secondly, Georgetta also asks how we can ensure that there's a level playing field, at least within the EU internal market, when the national competition authorities and the courts um, are not equally prepared and equipped to use this sort of um, AI-based evidence. Well, let me say that there's kind of two roles for, for this type of uh, got a data and data analysis. Uh, one is, you know, in the courts, as you described, but just Dutch is in those jurisdictions, the same is true in the US, you know, economic evidence can supplement some other evidence to, you know, to, to deliver a conviction, but it can never be the dominant kind of source of evidence. And so, so you so you really want to think about the use of data here and data analysis as akin to replacing a customer complaining to the competition authority, or competing competing firms complaining, or some other source. Which that in and of itself is 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 hardly ever evidence in the actual case. That's really to initiate an investigation, which will then deliver the evidence. So it goes back to this point here. I, I think, and, and there's kind of a general, I think, point here, which is, you know, how, where do you use in the process the data analysis? In this context here, it's really just to get to the state stage of uh, opening an investigation. Now, having said that, you know, you do want to be able to be, to be sufficient to, for example, get authority to do a dawn raid. Case in point, they did this in South Africa. They use screening to develop the evidence to get a dawn raid in the cement industry. So at that point, you know, then you do have to get some receptivity of the courts, you know, to, you know, to the data analysis. But but I feel like even if you don't get that, it's still you got to get past that first stage. You know, there are thousands and thousands of markets out there, and you have to think about well, which ones are really worthy of potential, you know, of a potential investigation. And that's where I think Carl tell screening has its biggest return. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from Ben Weber on price patterns. And his question is whether um, price patterns, whether these price patterns were observed in the Safeway uni unionization profit sharing cartel case. Um, this was a case where the cartel only kicked in when a company's workers went on strike. And so it appeared that it only happened once. Um, and he's also wondering if this approach could apply to wages and applying antitrust to wage suppression cartels? Uh, certainly in principle, yes. I mean, it, you know, it's, I mean, once again, I think for it to apply, there, it's, uh, there has to be some sort of regularity that's been identified. But let's just think about, you know, for example, you know, go back to some of the wage, you know, no poaching cases. If the agreement not to poach other workers uh, was preceded by competition, then again, there's going to, in this context, there's going to be a change in the wage generating process. There's going to be a change in turnover of employees between companies. Now, getting turnover between companies, that's 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 going to be difficult for a competition authority to get without it really having open an investigation. But you know, perhaps wages, you know, maybe. But the point is that if you can get it down to where the impact is on some observable variable, you know, then you can certainly, you know, look for a structural break that would be associated with the, you know, the, the, the move to inclusive and coordinated conduct. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from Thorn McCarty on the Swiss Action Study. Um, and his question is about whether you had independent identification of the collusive and competitive com 
competitive tenders and what was the source of this categorization? Right. Uh, so there's, there's been a number of studies done and they all have, to my knowledge, a common feature, which is you have data for a market when there was a cartel and then you have data for that same market after the time of the cartel. So the good part to that is that you're controlling for the firms. The firms are the same, and now you're just changing the, the, the conduct from coordinated to independent. Uh, the downside is you know, maybe the post-cartel conduct, which we presume is competitive, might not be competitive. It might be something different from a kind of a standard just competition in the, in the market. Uh, but that's almost all where the, the data is coming from. So uh, I think overall it's been accepted that that's, that's a sound approach. As I said, it's, it's subject to some weaknesses, but on net, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's been appropriate and fruitful one. We also have a question from David Latch, and I, I think um, Professor Williams and Professor Lina are happy for you to also weigh in on this one. Um, where are the best practices to utilize machine learning models? It seems that the standard essential patent licensing practices with multiple patents, complex royalty stacking is a good area to utilize these models. But in other areas, for instance, commodity cartels, the model may complicate the analysis with a second layer of debate over the validity and accuracy of the model. I think I'll start with you, Joseph, and then I can give a chance to Professor Williams or Professor Lina to give their insights. Okay, I'll, yeah, I can just com comment on the commodity cartel aspect to it. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's something to keep in mind here that machine learning in this context is potentially making the screens you know more effective. But if there was no machine learning, we can still engage in screening. And, and, and particularly in the case of commodity cartels, because we have a pretty good understanding of, of behavior in those types of markets. They're not complicated by large product differentiation. You know, the customers tend to be industrial customers who are just very much price sensitive. So I think in those contexts, you know, that machine learning is just kind of fine tuning, you know, some of the screens that have already been developed through just, which admittedly you might say ad hoc methods, but they're developed on economic theory and empirical analysis and understanding about, about past cartels. And I'll let, uh, you know, Daniel Marianne comment on the, the first part. Yeah, look, I, I was just going to say that, you know, machine learning, we, you know, we worry about the mistakes and the false positives and false negatives, but people make a lot more, okay? <laughs> so uh, I, I feel like, yeah, the, the main areas that I would avoid with machine learning is where, you know, the, 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 the cost of harm is very high, uh, where the risk you know, just isn't worth the reward. And uh, there are many industries where that's where safety is really just paramount or people might lose a lot of money or so, you know, machine learning is great for deciding where on the browser window shall we place an ad. Okay, so anything where the cost is low, you know, just go ahead and it's, it's awesome. Uh, and then as we sort of get to applications where, you know, there, there's a lot of consequence uh, for mistakes, then, you know, it, it's sort of less useful because we can't predict those mistakes. And, and often they're spectacular, right? They're, they're, they're just not something you would anticipate. It's not like, oh, it was a borderline case. No, it was just like all the other cases that, you know, got a positive outcome, but some small thing about that case uh, triggered a whole different, you know, uh, outcome. And, and, and that says, what does that say? It says this, this is chaos, right? That's what chaos is, you know. Uh, it's where you, you start with two things that are very close, it's very similar, and you get two completely different results. You know, that, that's turbulence. That's, that's not um, good at all. And so, you know, depending on the risks, and that was, that's exactly what we have to assess when we're using these models. But, you know, that doesn't preclude us from actually developing them. It's more about how we then go on to use them, what other ways we might have to actually verify certain outcomes and, and how much we're willing to pay for that. 
So, and, and I think people are only just beginning to understand this. The focus has been mainly on the performance of the algorithms uh, rather than the value that the, you know, the sort of the system with the human in, in the loop can actually generate for the business, for the government, for the regulator. Great. Um, Professor Elena, just a few remarks on that. Yeah, it's, it's so important always to ask compared to what. And so when it, when humans are making decisions, you know, what's the baseline mistakes are, are being made, there's false positives, false negatives there. I talked a lot about uh, fairness, accountability, transparency, bias, things like that. Well, we know the current systems have these issues as well, right? And and so can we design systems that, that um, and, and when humans are operating in these complex areas, we tend to use a lot of shortcuts to get to, uh, you know, and jump to conclusions and, and you know, make, you know, explain things after the fact without true explainability about why the decision was made, things like that. Uh, so I think the promise is, can we have systems where we use these tools where we increase transparency? We're worried about lack of transparency, but there's maybe a lot, not a lot of transparency in a lot of areas right now. Right, so so that's that's the promise, uh, in, in improving in all these areas and and not seeing some of the worst case outcomes, which I'm which I have a lot of optimism that we can do that. Right, we can actually think about how to design systems with humans are uh, being empowered, and that we bring in, in fact more transparency, fairness, um, and uh, you know better enforcement that produces more value for everyone. Great. Um, we are actually at time. So I just want to give the panelists maybe 20 seconds each just to wrap up and just give maybe a final concluding mark on, on this interesting discussion. Um, I think, um, Joseph, we can start with you. Okay. I'll, I'll just kind of conclude by making the comment about, about data. Uh, I, I think probably the most fruitful area direction to go is competition authorities working with their government procurement agencies to, for them to collect organize and share the kind of data that would be really useful for cartel screens. Great. Um, Professor Lina? Yeah, just uh, again, great paper. I'm really glad that this conference is happening. I think bringing people together, the publications of these articles, these are important conversations. And, uh, you know, I think all too often we think about kind of where this is all going to go and we don't realize our own agency in making decisions right now and guiding where this is going to go, identifying the obstacles, doing the work to overcome the obstacles. Thank you. Professor Williams, any last remarks? Yeah, great, great, great paper. It really opens a really uh, interesting door. And I think that we can get a lot of insights from uh, agent-based simulations to kind of come up with you know, um, less crude kinds of patterns that we can look for and recognize. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much to all of you and for our engaging panel. Um, this has been really insightful. I'll now hand over the floor to Tibor.